Franklin Tandon City Clerk of Chicago, and I was invited to speak. Thank you so much for having me tonight about our new program, The City Key. So first, I want to know, raise your hand if you have a valid government ID. Okay, so quite a few. Raise your hand if you've ever, ever had to show your ID to get into Merchandise Mart or in a building. Okay. Raise your hand if you had to ever show your ID for a doctor's appointment. Okay, okay. Raise your ID if you had to go pick up your niece, nephew, your kids at a public school. Okay, so I can see we're not in that kind of room. No one's having kids yet. Okay. <laughs> All right, gotcha, gotcha. Well, you see where I'm going with this, right? We, uh, people ask why, why the government ID? In fact, uh, many aldermen ask why, and I keep repeating it, because it's a privilege that not a lot of folks have, and it's something that we take for granted. In fact, 14% um, of the Latino population here in the country uh, do not have adequate ID, and 10% of the African American population nationally do not have an adequate government ID. And this is the why. And I think as government, we have to ask ourselves the why and what is our intention. And so this idea actually came from community groups. If you ask them, they've been talking about this for 10 years. Um, if you ask government, it's three years ago that we started looking at this program. There was a year task force that looked at many vulnerable populations, including domestic violence survivors, LGBTQ, our seniors, immigrant population, uh, returning citizens, um, and many more folks that could not get the state ID or driver's license because of accessibility, the $20 fee, or even the documentation needed. So they said, government, what can you do to help? And so City of Chicago stepped up. We put a million dollars in the 2016 budget um, for this program. That's before I was pre-city clerk. What else happened in 2016? Anyone else know what happened in 2016? Maybe around November? Um, I know, we have PTSD, we don't wanna think about it. Cubs won, that's when we all knew it was gonna go downhill. Sorry, go Sox. So, we looked at this program. I came in January 25th of 2017, um, a few days after that guy in the White House. And we had a couple problems. We wanted to still do this program, and we knew it was important to a lot of communities, but now we had an issue with people wanting to give us data, wanting us to give us their information. And we had a lot of fear and anxiety about addresses specifically being shared, something that New York City was going through because New York City captured addresses and had it, and people were afraid the federal government would FOIA that information, get it, would understand. So that was something. So this data right here is actually data that we've collected through the partnership with the University of Chicago. Why is it important to collect data? You all know, right? And I think as government, we've got to hold ourselves accountable to understand the why and how people are actually using our product. And so just in the few months, we've noticed that 23% of the population that have come, so like roughly 20,000 cards, ID cards, about 20,000 ID cards since April we've been giving out, 23% uh, came because they did not have a government ID. 25% had trouble entering private, private and public buildings. In fact, we had a woman who was trying to get chemotherapy and could not get it without ID. We had another woman who was trying to pick up her child's report card and could not get into the school without an, without an ID. We had another gentleman that had been living in the city of Chicago for 20 years and never had a government ID and he got it to get married. So we are seeing this trend, 20% um, had trouble accessing healthcare, and 46% got a city key because of city services. So that's pretty powerful in itself. This is what the card looks like. What do you think? You like it? Does it look hip? Does it look cool? Would you get it? All right, and more excitement here, okay? So why I love this program so much is I have to give out a special shout out to my policy director, Tonan Singh, who is here and she'll be answering a lot of the technical questions, because you know, I'm vision, I'm broad strokes, that's what us public servants do. But Tonan Singh has been with this program from day one, when it started in the Office of New Americans. And what we really found was, when we started asking people, we had, in the first three months, we had 50 community meetings, 50. In fact, my very first meeting was in Chatham at a public library with African American seniors who were grilling me, grilling me um, about this ID card. Why do I need it? I don't need another card in my wallet. How much is it gonna cost me? I don't wanna pay for something. I already have a state ID. You know, and I, you could already see 
um, what people thought, you know, what this program, um, was it going to help them? So we listened to a lot of that criticism, and we also listened to a lot of feedback um, through this process. We listened and we asked questions. Well, why would you want to get this ID card? What would motivate you to get this card if you already had a state ID or a driver's license? And that's when someone gave us the idea about integrating the technology. So we were the first, we were the first ID card in the country to both put your library card and your CTA card in one. And then we also created it as a medical ID. Um, it has an emergency contact. You could, so you could put, if you have, you know, we had someone with a child with autism, we were able to put on the back of the card. We were able to also put emergency contact. And then our fourth benefit, if you look at the back, is now a prescription discount. So now it allows people, the Chicago RX card, allows people to access um, prescription discounts, medical device discounts, up to 56,000 different pharmacies here in Chicago. And that idea did not come from City Clerk Anna Valencia. It came from Michelle Garcia at Access Living. It was her idea to, to put the prescription discount on the card. And that's why I love this policy, because every piece of the card came from a different community group or different advocates asking for it. So one of the aldermen definitely said, I just don't want another card in your wallet. So we made the three-in-one or the four-in-one now. Someone said it has to be hip, it has to look cool, the people would want to get it, so the, you know, the cool kids would want to get it up in Logan Square. So that's why we made the design the way it looks like. Um, sorry if you're from Logan Square, I had to throw it out there. <laughs> and then some folks said, I want it for my kid, because we see actually a large population of homeless youth, even under the age of 14. And so we made it for zero to 120, or however old Secretary White is. So we made sure, <laughs> that it was for everyone, that it was inclusive, it was accessible. And so then we said, you know, how are we going to get this out in the community? We can't, you know, um, we can't, we have to take certain information um, to make it secure and not fraudulent, but we also have to make it accessible because that's what we heard, you know, either the fee or was it hard to get to. So we made it free for the first um, 100,000 cardholders to gin some excitement, and we also made it mobile. So we actually go to libraries, We've actually gone to one church. We go to um, park district centers, senior centers, community nonprofits that host us, where people can build trust. They don't want to come down to government and downtown and have to pay for parking or have to get transportation or childcare. So we bring it to them. We also are trying to modernize government, so just not offering hours nine to five, but we offer Saturday hours and evening hours as well. Just ask my staff, because or my team, because they will vouch for that. And we have seen so much excitement. The very first day, we had 500 people line up at Kennedy and King College in Inglewood. And we were actually had to close the doors in the first two hours. So we thought we would have a hard time reaching populations. It turned out to be completely opposite because we made a card that people wanted. We made a card for Chicagoans by Chicagoans. And they're on the phone with their grandmas and their sisters and say, hey, come, come get your ID card. So the excitement. Um, we have seen worked because when you make grassroots policy with the community instead of talking at the community or not listening to the community or pretending you're listening, um, you get bad policy. But when we brought them into the process to the point where they were actually sitting down with our pro bono attorneys at Kirkland and Ellis, deciding which documents could be which points to get the ID card and which documents could be as accessible that people had, our document guide is like four pages long that allows people to use a point system to get the ID. So these are some of the partners, and not a whole complete list, but you can see these are some of the partners that were at the table with us, that were telling us, hey, my client um, has a hard time getting their birth certificate, or my client, you know, what about an expired state ID? Um, they can't get a driver's license with expired state ID, but we could take it. Um, and so we have seen so many documents, or if you're homeless, can a nonprofit sponsor you with the letterhead that gives you a point to show residency until you can get back on your feet? And so with these community partners, and this is not the whole list, but a good example, we were able to create a really exciting card that's not, not only very exciting with the technology that we used, um, but also just helping people. And that's what we're supposed to do in government, right, is help people. And so that's what our team has done um, and super proud of it. Some of the other benefits that we added. So not only did we integrate the technologies, not only is it a prescription discount card, an emergency contact, and you can put intent to donate your organs, and a veteran's designation, and the first municipal ID card in the state 
To self-identify your gender, meaning uh, female, male, non-binary, or leaving it blank. In fact, we had a 15-year-old come into our office without a parent and choose their own gender. Um, and, and I love that because it gives that person that identity that they choose to say who they are. And so we decided though, when we were asking various people, why would you get the ID card? How could um, you support that program? Not only being a good neighbor, but we didn't want this ID card to be a stigma card. We didn't want it only to be for homeless or for domestic violence survivors or undocumented community. We wanted it to be for everyone, so everyone could blend in. So there was no indicator or immigration status, housing status, criminal status, whatever. I had it, the mayor had it. It was going to be for everyone. So we added some benefits and discounts. Why not? You pay taxes. I hope everyone pays taxes. Um, why not get some kind of benefit for living in Chicago and being a Chicago resident? So the Field Museum kicked in a free day. So if you bring your ID card, you get a free day at the Field Museum. And we're working with other cultural partners. The Chicago Fire is getting, giving a discount. Chicago Sky, the Red Stars. We've got um, different restaurants and boutiques and different places throughout the city. And if you haven't been, but in um, Avondale there's a Brew Brew Coffee, and that's a great place. The Back of the Yards Coffee Shop is awesome as well. There's many different places that we are trying now to get Chicagoans to unlock what everything Chicago has to offer with the city key. You get it? City key, unlock, okay. All right, you're with me. So unlock everything. We want Chicagoans to explore other neighborhoods. We want to see what's out there. And we want people in every zip code to know that the downtown area is accessible to them by the Field Museum. Because if you look at our little, if you look at our museums, which hopefully I can shame them into joining, you know, the percentage of the numbers, if you look at the zip code, it's not always um, representative of the, of the communities that we serve. And so we want them to have access to all that Chicago has to offer. And we want people to get out of their comfort zone and support other local businesses. So this is, we have, I think, up to over 40 partners, and it's expanding, and hopefully you have some more, like the, Gold, uh, the Goodman Theater, the Joffrey Ballet, 10% off tickets to Joffrey Ballet. Swan Lake's coming. Go. <laughs> so this is a little bit of our partnerships, but this was another great way to get people to sign up for City Key, and we're always expanding. So we hope that next year we'll have more partners. Um, maybe some more uh, technology advances and, um, and, and streamlining some of our services. Um, but this is just kind of a list. So now we're going to open up to questions. And uh, Tom is right. Wh Why did you look behind you? This is Tom. <laughs> He's like, wait, who? No, you. So Tom is, was formerly with DUE, the Department of Technology. And Tonantin is our policy director. And we're happy to answer some questions about kind of the partnerships or the key or any of the policy program that you have. Hi, okay, um, so I don't know if you were planning to get to this, but I am, of course, very interested in the data and the structure of how you're saving anything. Everything, I was aware of sort of the issues with New York ID, um, and it was something you were worried about after 2016, so I'm curious to see how you're sort of anonymizing data and protecting the data of users. Um, I know you touched on it a little bit, and those are probably not um, taking addresses, et cetera, but would love to hear a little bit more. Sure, so I'm gonna let one of them speak, but just kind of the one uh, key that we had in our state law was exactly what a record meant that the city would have to keep. And so that allowed us to not have to keep the addresses to consider that a record. So when you go, who has their city key in here? All right, support of the program. Everyone else get their city key, please. We should have brought a printer. But um, when you go to our mobile sites, you'll see that actually we give applications back. So we don't keep any physical applications. We are able to give that back. But I'll let Tonantzin kind of talk about that and Tom talk about the data piece. Tom? Okay. Yeah. So that's a very good question. The data that was going to be collected or potentially could be collected in a program like this is very, very sensitive. And, and we know from the lessons out of New York City, New Haven, Connecticut, which had the first municipal ID program in, in the country, uh, but had their records uh, subsequently subpoenaed by the Department of Homeland Security. So we created a new technology. We created a new approach to this. Uh, clerk already mentioned that the application, the application goes right back to the individual. On the database side, on the card side, no information is kept. We created a new way to be able to make this card interoperable with these other systems, but the fact that I hold a municipal ID in my pocket, there's no record of that holding a municipal ID. To the systems using the municipal ID, such as CTA, such as a library card, 
they appear as a card that already exists in their systems, as any other card would, whether it's the green library card or the municipal ID. So we created this sort of decentralized, interoperable way of being able to do that, specifically to be able to protect privacy, offer privacy uh, for those who have that card so they can know and hold on to it confidently. Yeah, and I would just add that our approach, as the clerk kind of mentioned, was that we were a major city that was going to do this after the administration came. So there was kind of like a change in the dynamic with the community organizations that we originally worked with. It went from, yes, we need a municipal ID to, I'm not sure this is safe. And so one of the first things that we ended up doing was uh, making sure that we actually brought those same community groups to the table. So a lot of immigrant rights organizations, ACLU of Illinois, um, other organizations that were concerned with data privacy, security issues, met with them constantly. Actually, it was kind of interesting. I had to do a lot of research on this because this was the first time that I'd ever really experienced an issue uh, at this level at this point in time. Um, and I ended up finding a really neat memo from Forrest Gregg that actually informed a lot of the work that we were doing. And it kind of set this like tone for, okay, we're gonna do this program, but we need to do it right. So obviously we're gonna bring these community groups to the table. Um, one of the things that we did as part of the policy development was, okay, we're gonna do an ordinance, we gotta establish this program. How can we build trust with you during this time when there is a lot of distrust with government? And one of the things that the community organizations asked for was to explicitly put in our ordinance that we would not retain addresses or telephone numbers. Now, before we could do that, we had to figure out, to meet our Records Act, is there technology that exists that lets us operate within this framework? We were looking at New York. New York was destroying records. We can't even retain records without some, having that become something that then the federal government can subpoena. So we actually were very fortunate that San Francisco was another model that we were actually able to look to. And so I think one of the major lessons that we learned was that you can actually really learn a lot from other cities. And one of the strengths, in addition to being a card that was designed entirely by Chicagoans, is that a lot of cities were helpful in helping us figure out what worked, what didn't, and then what is going to be the model that we're going to use to make it unique to Chicago. This is just sort of an out there question, but I'm always fascinated by Estonia, the, the, the country, did a sort of experiment where they issued government IDs to every citizen that had a cryptographic hash with a little electronic key card in it. Do you guys ever see that maybe in the far future that everyone could have an actual digital signature ID that they could use for their bank account or for their medical records? <coughs> Is that possible down the road? Yeah, absolutely. It, you're going to be, want to be cautious about doing that. It was, in fact, about this time when the uh, municipal ID card was coming together that uh, a flaw was discovered in the hash uh, right about that time. And Estonia very known for using e-government to the extreme, online voting only, and, and that, that digital hash was everything. So even a well-developed program, an extraordinarily well-funded program uh, that they had in Estonia, there's still some of that sensitivity. Uh, I noted some folks out there said that uh, they're a little technophobic or uh, have uh, hesitancy around that technology. So I think more has to be done to make sure that that technology is good enough. Anytime we're using cryptographic hashes, it's, it's always something can always go wrong. And so when we took approach on this, we're very careful to make sure that we, d while there's a lot of technology available for us, to not push too far because that could push into an area that, that is, as a clerk and Tenantin has alluded to before, could potentially destroy that trust that's very important for a card and the sensitive operations of this card. In the future, yeah, it's certainly possible, but uh, uh, on the technology side, I think more has to be done to make sure that we're investing in te technology that makes sense. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the ID on your card, though, is a cryptographic hash, yeah. which we can then use to verify whether or not that card has been doctored in any sort of way, and so we do have some, some of that technology embedded into in kind of an analog fashion, but to make sure that this card is a valid card at the end of the day. Hi, um, as someone from New York, it's really interesting to hear the discussion about how New York failed. So they didn't fail. They have a, a I, they have an extreme, really, like really, really good program. In fact, their program is like twenty-two million dollars, and they have thirty employees, which is like my dream. <laughs> my program, our program, is one point seven million dollars, and we have two employees. And, we have, and we're third largest city. So we're actually developing like a toolkit 
that we can give to other cities because other cities with not a large budget, like you know, LA, New York, and us, are wanting to do this similar program, but trying to figure out how to do it in a budget that works for them. Great, so you mentioned um, homeless people being able to get this card, but also that there's an address and a phone number listed on this card. So what types of documents do you require to ensure that this is a real person, like you, you people who don't have those types of permanent yeah. I'll let also Tanantina speak on this too, but the biggest thing when we were talking to Night Ministry and other um, homeless advocates was that we had to make sure there were documents that were easy to get. Because the nonprofits and their caseworkers can help them, but what nonprofits are running into, especially with the budget crisis in Illinois, is their budgets have been cut for helping people to get IDs. So it was extremely expensive and staff time consuming to go get the birth certificate, to get a social security card, and all the documents for a state ID. So what we try to do is figure out ways that what documents are easy for people to get. Is it a medical record? Is it a case management letter? Um, is it an expired like you know, high school transcript or, or a nonprofit letter? It, it, we were trying to think of other government documents that would prove the identity. We do require at least a photo ID. So it has to be a photo ID to at least see the person, and then we require another list of documents to get to three points to prove identity, and then you need to prove residency. So you can talk about some of the documents you've seen. But we actually had a gentleman come in, um, our, our receptionist talked to Tony, who if you ever come to the city clerk's office, you'll love Tony, and she helped him um, get to, they kept coming back to get the city key. He was homeless. He actually, um, he was a veteran as well, and he got his city key, ended up going to the bank and found out that he had like $50,000 in his bank from social security um, checks that had never been, he was unable to get access to. True story. But I'm telling you this, but he had to come back multiple times because he was homeless. We had to make sure we could get to a nonprofit that could help him get the documents he needed. But our documents are a lot easier accessible um, than what it would be for the state ID. And then the nonprofits have to shell out the $20 for the state ID, and they just don't have the budget anymore. Yeah, and, and I would add that we, we learned that a lot from the community organizations by setting up very like specific, um, in addition to the round tables, it was kind of like a, just for like certain populations we were trying to serve. So we brought in a bunch of nonprofits one day and did like a round table just on homeless and housing issues, another one on immigration, and all these other populations that we were specifically trying to target and figure out what are the issues that, are, that you grapple with the most, what are the barriers, and so one of the things that we ended up adding was also kind of like an affidavit where somebody, like a nonprofit, for example, can sign off because if they've been serving someone for many years, they can vouch for the person essentially. Um, but one of the things that we found that really truly helps is that we have a point system that, you know, maybe you have a document that counts as three points, but uh, someone else doesn't have that three point document, but they'll have three one-point documents. And so they're able to kind of collect until they're able to meet the point system. And I think that, in addition to like having organizations closely at the table who are like, one, we know about the city key, two, we helped you develop this, and three, we're trying to figure out how to help this person collect the documents, we've actually been able to expand our existing list. So one of the things that we purposefully did from a policy perspective was we didn't put the details of the specific documents that would count towards our point system into our ordinance. Because if we had done that, we would have to go back to city council every time we wanted to add a document. And we wanted to make sure that this program was incredibly dynamic, that it changed as we learned more from the community organizations and the experiences um, that we were encountering. And so it's been great that we put those the, the list of documents into our administrative rules. And so we've been able to either add or amend um, as we go. Awesome. I believe that is all the time that we have. It is 6.50. Oh, you're good. So, and I'm sorry, I, could, I could chat about this all night, and my team's going to um, stay a little bit longer. But I do have to go to another Hispanic Heritage Month uh, celebration. But thank you so much. And thank you for being engaged in our civic, what's happening in our communities in Chicago. And please get a city key card. Please sign up. Thank you.